excited to welcome all of you here today to our Dr. Martin Luther King Day program. In a moment, I'll ask Sheldon Danziger to come up and give a real introduction to our speakers, um, but I do want to welcome them personally. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Today's event is sponsored, uh, co-sponsored by the National Poverty Center, uh, which has been housed at the Ford School since 2002. And as I think uh, everybody in this room knows, it's really internationally recognized for its research on causes and consequences of poverty and evaluation of anti-poverty programs. Um, our panel today is also sponsored by one of the Ford School's most active student groups. That's the Students of Color in Public Policy. And I'd like to thank all of the members of SKIP for co-sponsoring our MLK Day to event today and helping to encourage all of the students uh, to join us and to participate. As I mentioned, uh, in just a moment, Sheldon Danziger will be speaking and giving a full introduction uh, to our panelists. Um, he's the co-director of the National Poverty Center and the Henry J. Meyer Distinguished University Professor of Public Policy. In 1989, Sheldon founded the Research and Training Program on Poverty and Public Policy at the University of Michigan, and it's a program that has supported uh, doctoral students and postdocs who are members of traditionally underrepresented groups. Early in their career, um, both Mary and Sandra participated in that program, and that makes it especially delightful for us to welcome them uh, back with us here today. Um, they, as you'll hear, have gone on to do so many interesting things that we're looking forward to hearing about. And so I thank you for coming out, for coming out on such a very cold day uh, to join us for what I anticipate will be a very interesting, lively, active discussion. Again, welcome to the Ford School. And with that, perhaps uh, I would like to welcome Sheldon Danziger to the podium. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm going to introduce all three of the program participants today, and then uh, each will speak, and then we'll have time for uh, question and answers at the end. And uh, that'll be followed by a reception and uh, a book signing. There are copies of um, books by our speakers today, and I'll mention the books when I introduce them uh, for sale. Uh, afterwards, and uh, they'll even autograph the books for you. Um, as Susan mentioned, uh, for uh, a faculty member and mentor of postdoctoral fellows, um, the uh, greatest reward is seeing your former mentees uh, excel, and that certainly is the case with both uh, Mary Patillo and Sandra Smith. Um, uh, the uh, quite remarkable thing is that both were undergraduates at Columbia University. Uh, both were uh, doctoral students at the University of Chicago, working with William Julius Wilson and others. And after Chicago, both uh, were postdoctoral fellows here at uh, the University of Michigan. Mary Patillo is now professor of sociology and African American Studies at Northwestern University. She's also a faculty associate in the Institute for Policy Research. Uh, Mary's first book, Black Picket Fences, Privilege and Peril Among the Black Middle Class, uh, was something she worked on while she was a postdoctoral fellow here. Uh, it won a number of prizes, including the Oliver Cromwell Cox Best Award from the American uh, Sociological Association. And today she'll be talking about her most recent book, uh, Black on the Block, The Politics of Race and Class uh, in the City. In addition to uh, her academic work and uh, chairing her department, uh, Mary is a founding board member of the Urban Prep Charter Academy for Young Men in Chicago. So um, Mary is an example of an academic who's venturing out into the uh, real world. And um, I wish her the best of luck on that because <laughs> I think that's a lot harder than uh, writing uh, prize-winning academic books. Uh, our second speaker is Sandra Smith, who is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, uh, 
I don't want to jinx things, but her department and college have put her up for tenure, so I think the next time we see her, she'll be an associate professor of sociology. Um, she previously taught at New York University, was a visiting scholar at the Russell Sage Foundation, uh, and next year will be a visiting scholar at uh, Stanford Center for the Advanced Study in uh, the Behavioral Sciences. Her new book uh, is Lone Pursuit, Distrust in Defensive Individualism Among the Black Poor. And uh, this was a project she started while she was a postdoctoral fellow at Michigan. And uh, the study uh, respondents uh, were interviewed. They uh, live in Southeast Michigan. Uh, after uh, Mary and Sandra talk about their books, uh, David Harding is going to be a discussant. David is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology. Uh, he's the co-author of a book, uh, The Social Roots of School Shooting, and the author of a new book in progress, uh, Living the Drama, um, Why Neighborhoods Matter for Inner City Boys. Uh, with that, I'm going to sit down and turn it over to Mary. And, um, Somebody will tell you how to turn on the screen. I think we did it. Great, thank you. So thank you all for coming and the joy of coming back to where you did some work is the, um, another opportunity to say thank you. So I really thank you, Sheldon, for the support that I had while being here and for many other people that I see here who were here when I was here or other friends and colleagues. It really is great to be back um, in, these, in this beautiful new home. It's a new home from when I was here, but it really is great to be back. So thank you, Sheldon. In 1966, Martin Luther King came to Chicago bringing the civil rights movement north. Chicago was the new battleground, and after strategizing with local leaders in Chicago, they decided that the strategy or the, what they would focus on in Chicago was what was called an end slums campaign. And that's a button on the left from the end slums campaign in Chicago um, around in 1966. Uh, King moved into a rundown apartment building on the west side of Chicago. And he drew attention to the conditions in poor black neighborhoods in Chicago and thus to poor black neighborhoods in northern cities overall. Soon he was leading thousands, thousands of people in marches through white communities, drawing attention to the severe racial discrimination and racism that existed in the North. After one such march, King remarked, quote, I have seen many demonstrations in the South, but I have never seen anything so hostile and so hateful as I've seen here today. The campaign in Chicago had mixed results with some promises from the Daley administration, the mayor at that time, many of those promises weren't kept and concessions from local businesses to invest in black institutions. But in 1968, when King was assassinated, Chicago's black communities erupted in outrage, and the scars remain visible even today. That's a photograph of one of the business districts on the west side um, right after the riots in 1968, and much of the um, commercial, many of the commercial strips, especially on the white, uh, west side, remain relatively disinvested and um, uh, underutilized today. So this talk is about the government's end slums campaigns of today, or the end slums policy strategies of today, or at least one major component of the kinds of approaches that policy is, the kinds of approaches toward central city neighborhoods. And in particular, I'll be talking about the demolition of public housing and its replacement with what are, what's the mantra in the policy world and housing, mixed income communities. So first let me set the national context. Um, it's no surprise that there is a housing crisis. Uh, much, much of the housing crisis is right now being discussed in terms of um, mortgage, mortgage cri the mortgage crisis, but there is of course a housing crisis around affordable housing. And these are, this is figures from the National Low Income Housing Coalition on the percentage of people with housing problems and the percentage of people who lack health insurance and the percentage of people who are food insecure. And I show this because, of course, especially uh, universal health insurance is really on our radar screen as our politicians are always talking about universal health insurance, but housing is not really on our radar screen in terms of 
um, things that are important uh, as, as policy initiatives, but yet 35% of Americans experience some kind of housing problem, whether that be overcrowding or substandard con conditions or what is called um, cost, being cost burdened or paying more than 30% of your income towards rent. And you see that's particularly acute in the left or your right hand slide, uh, particularly acute for families earning under $25,000 where nearly 70% of families are experiencing some kind of um, housing problem. So this gives you a sense of the magnitude and the importance of housing issues even though it's not really on our national radar screen. This is just one more way to look at it. I don't know if you can see those numbers, but the darker the shading, the more minimum wage jobs you need to afford a fair market rent two bedroom apartment in those places. So the darkest shaded places are places where you need three minimum, more than three minimum wage jobs to afford a fair market rent two bedroom. And the mid gray are where you need two to three jobs. And the few places that are like Michigan <laughs> that, um, that are not uh, mid-shaded are places that you need two, fewer than two jobs. Michigan's right there on two. But still, you need two minimum wage jobs to afford a fair market rent two-bedroom apartment. Again, to give you a sense of the housing crisis. But in the middle of this housing crisis, middle-class households are a hot commodity. They're touted by policymakers and urban planners as necessary participants in curing the ills of public housing and the plague of urban poverty more generally. After population growth, the most frequent indicator of the health of a city is its per capita income or its, per capita, or its fam median family income. The higher, the better. Rich households are even better than middle class ones. So this is just an example of how Money Magazine decides on its best places to live um, and how they, they eliminate cities, they can't be the best places to live, that have low education scores, high crime rates, absurdly high housing costs, decline in employment, or low or income less than 90% of state median. In many respects, these are pulling in opposite directions because high, absurdly high housing costs are often the places where higher income people live, um, and so, but not wanting low income people in the cities kind of pulls in two different directions. Middle class residents and the affluent even more raise property values and thus property tax revenue. They consume more and thus contribute to higher sales tax revenue. They attract businesses that also pay taxes. They fund the coffers of political campaigns and they demand less in the way of costly social services. Using the same logic then, poverty is a drag on cities. The lower the proportion of poor people, the better. So urban poverty rates can be lowered in three ways. First, you can help poor people or poor city residents get out of poverty. So you're decreasing the number of poor people by making poor people not poor. You can increase the numbers of non-poor people in cities by luring them from elsewhere. We often call that gentrification. Or you can decrease the number of poor people by sending them somewhere else. And this is what's been done through some demonstration programs like Moving to Opportunity, where public housing residents are encouraged to move to low poverty neighborhoods outside of central cities. Public housing policy in particular and efforts at urban revitalization more generally engage all three of these strategies for, sh for sure, um, but I'm going to be talking mostly about strategies number two and three, which are often touted as routes to strategy number one. So the, no the, the idea is if you can move people out of poor neighborhoods, that is the strategy toward helping poor people not be poor anymore. Um, there are many critiques of that, but I'll mostly be talking about strategies two and three. Um, of course, anti-poverty policy of this sort that's kind of urban focused will have decidedly racial contours since the poverty rate among blacks is about twice as high, three times as high as that of whites and of course the concentration of black poverty is much greater than the concentration of white poverty. So this is in Chicago, the percentage of blacks, Asians, non-Hispanic whites and Hispanics who live in high poverty neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are above 20% poor and you see the concentration of poverty is much more pronounced with 40, almost half of all African Americans in Chicago living in neighborhoods that are more than 20% poor. So basically what this illustrates is the racial contours of concentrated poverty and the fact that those kinds of place-based anti-poverty strategies that either move poor people out of poor neighborhoods or bring non-poor people into poor neighborhoods will disproportionately affect black neighborhoods because of the greater concentration of poverty um, among African Americans. <clears throat> 
In the 1950s, when people were leaving cities for the suburbs, urban renewal was proffered as the way to stop the bleeding of the middle classes. Today, we don't use the term urban renewal, but the strategy isn't that much different. So the strategy that, um, that kind of is the centerpiece of the federal housing policy that I'll be talking about is called HOPE 6. Um, it aims to, quote, lessen concentrations of poverty by placing public housing in non-poverty neighborhoods and promoting mixed income communities. 239 HOPE 6 revitalization grants have been granted uh, during that time. And under HOPE 6, over 100,000 units of public housing will, de will be demolished across the country. So again, I want you to think about that number in light of the housing crunch that I started with in the beginning. Here we have a serious crisis in terms of the availability of affordable housing, but yet there is this massive demolition of public housing, uh, public housing that's been deemed severely distressed, and in those public housing projects where these, build, where these units will be demolished, only about half will come back online as public housing. So they'll be, again, located within these mixed income communities for, and in these places there'll be a net decline, or a, um, about a half uh, decrease in the availability of, public, of uh, affordable housing. So there are many um, justifications for these mixed income uh, policies and perhaps um, kind of foundationally was the work of William Julius Wilson, who posited that high levels of neighborhood poverty had negative consequences for residents above and beyond their individual poverty. Wilson and others initiated a research industry to uncover and describe what were called concentration effects. Wilson argued that, quote, the declining presence of working and middle-class blacks also deprives ghetto neighborhoods of key resources, including structural resources, such as residents with income to sustain neighborhood services, and cultural resources, such as conventional role models and neighbor, uh, for neighborhood children. So while Wilson lobbied most force, but while Wilson lobbied most forcefully for labor market and safety net reforms, he made brief mention of this quote I have here, the quote, reintegration of the neighborhood with working and middle class blacks and black professionals as one possible strategy. Again, his emphasis was more on labor market strategies, but he made this reference um, in the text. However, he was not all that hopeful about this strategy. He called it the so-called self-help programs to revitalize the inner city. And he was surprised when these mixed income projects or mixed income, this mixed income mantra came to the fore that they, quote, received so much serious attention from the media and policymakers. So given Wilson's own distancing from such a strategy, it's curious that policymakers have latched on to this research as the scientific basis for policies that emphasize class integration. On second inspection, however, the embrace of the mixed income route makes sense because it's consonant with urban elites, urban elites interests in recapturing the middle class for the city's tax base. Whereas Wilson's other proposals, such as creating a tight labor market, extensive and expensive job training, more generous and universal welfare benefits, and pro-union le legislation are all not in in, um, aligned with urban elites' interests around bringing in a greater tax base. So mixed income communities as cures to urban poverty represent a decidedly non-structural policy intervention relying on the prospect of cross-class affiliation to combat the existing forces of systemic stratification. The increased municipal revenue that comes with the influx of middle-class residents could, in theory, equalize the structural landscape by funding things like high-quality public preschools, wage increases for civil servant employees, or investments in public transportation. But in practice, such a redistribution of resources often takes a back seat to feeding the demands of the new gentry for things like more public art, smoother streets, and support for more high-end housing, recreational, and commercial activities. I wrote an op-ed in the Chicago Tribune where I counterposed uh, Mayor Daley's um, beautification of the downtown area, and goodness knows, as I said in the, uh, the op-ed, I love to drive on Lakeshore Drive and see all the pretty plantings. It's a beautifully landscaped city, but I don't want to do that at the expense of the demolition of public housing. Because both public sector and the private market cater to the coveted middle class citizen consumer, the underlying structures of inequality are left intact, even if the neighborhoods look better. Finally, if gentrification is the point at which mixed income communities tip upward, then whatever structural reforms had been enacted, 
better schools or more jobs or a cleaner environment now disproportionately benefit the incoming gentry rather than the outgoing poor residents. In this formulation, the mixed income approach is not simply non-structural in its ideological foundations, but anti-structural, reinforcing and replicating a system of haves and have-nots, this time with government support. So those were my kind of sociological critiques of uh, mixed income communities. And these are my more, um, these are the critiques com coming from my own particular research on this topic. So I argue that the popular mixed income approach has four important weaknesses. First of all, it plans for racial integration but underestimates the tenacity of racial segregation. Second, it ignores the mix mixed income reality of many black neighborhoods. Uh, even though those neighborhoods don't seem to fully benefit from that reality. Third, it resigns itself to and reinforces the unjust status quo, whereby poor neighborhoods don't get public investments and middle class neighborhoods do. And fourth, and this is the one I'll expand upon most, uh, most in this research, it, it promotes a quote, what I'm calling a tyranny of the middle class. In sum, instead of making needed public and private investments in poor and black residents and neighborhoods as and where they are, mixed income strategies suggest that the people will benefit more if they simply move to greener pastures and that the neighborhoods are only eligible for such investments if middle class people move in them. Both scenarios dismiss the as-is worthiness of poor and black residents and neighborhoods. So let me briefly um, expand on the first three critiques, and then I'll say a little bit more about the fourth. First, moving poor and black families into non-poor and predominantly white areas has garnered sufficient resistance from white homeowners and communities that it has been possible only on a small scale. This just gives you a sense in Chicago where we are demolishing public housing and residents are moving with housing choice vouchers, or it used to be called Section 8 vouchers, where you can move into the private rental market. In Chicago, 72% of movers with these vouchers moved to neighborhoods that were over 90% African American, despite the fact that over half of them, when surveyed, said that they, would, that they would like to live in a neighborhood where there is a mix of African American, Hispanic, and white residents. So while the preference seemed to be for uh, integrated living, the outcome seemed to be more segre repeat, repeated segregated living, partially because of steering of some of the housing choice counselors, as well as just the availability of apartments, the reception by landlords. There's a lot of research on this um, particular topic on the resegregation of people with vouchers, of African Americans with vouchers, and their disproportionate clustering into other, uh, into similarly, similarly African American and only somewhat less poor neighborhoods. So this idea about moving poor people from poor neighborhoods out into other neighborhoods underestimates um, the tenacity of racial segregation. The second critique is that many black neighborhoods are mixed income, not by design, but because of the combination of racial segregation and disproportionate black poverty. So my first book, Black Picket Fences, was on this topic. It was about a black lower middle class neighborhood that was mixed income just because um, it had a both a somewhat um, weaker housing market and thus allowed uh, lower income families to move in. And it had middle class families who had been there for a number of years. And it kind of created this organic mixed income community to begin with. With. This is a map of Chicago, and can I make this? Yeah. So um, this is a map of Chicago by race. The bluer areas are African American, and the um, non-shaded areas are white. And the dots are the location of grocery stores by race in Chicago. And what you see is in this large swath of the black south side, which is class heterogeneous. So while this area here might be predominantly poor, these neighborhoods here are more um, lower middle class, middle class, and some of them are even somewhat affluent. And you still see the dearth of grocery stores as, a com as compared to the middle class white neighborhoods along the North Lakefront. So this is just to give you a sense of even that mixed income black neighborhoods clearly are, are uh, do not create a panacea for these black neighborhoods just because they're mixed income. There remains a disinvestment. I, I could do this map for a number of things. Uh, mortgage dollars invested or um, probably even municipal dollars invested. And it shows you that mixed income is not the only answer, that there remains a discriminatory um, effect for predominantly black neighborhoods even if they are mixed income. <clears throat> 
The third critique is that mixed income strategy is resigned to the unjust status quo. One rationale for mixed income communities is that the political and economic clout of middle class newcomers will benefit their poor neighbors through increased public services and commercial investment for the whole neighborhood. This assumption illustrates that mixed income approaches are resigned to the unjust status quo in which poor and black neighborhoods are not worthy of public and private investments on their own. Inst instead, they have to be able to attract middle income folks. While one cannot help but acknowledge the positive changes that accompany new middle class residents, assuming that they are necessary for such changes buys into the disenfranchisement of poor families. Are only neighborhoods with middle class citizens entitled to working street lights, respective and effective policing, attractive parks, and affordable preschool? When the question is posed in that manner, it becomes clear that the logic behind mixed income communities is actually backwards. When poor families with few resources are clustered in neighborhoods, they have a greater need for such state-funded goods than concentrations of more affluent families do. Theoretically, once the middle class moves in, the state should be able to move out. Um, and this, is, this gives you a sense, I'm, there I'm talking about the state, here I'm talking about the private sector, where many people might say, okay, well, the state should move in, but we understand the private sector is going where the disposable income is. So if the private sector is not in, in, um, in black or poor neighborhoods, then we can understand why that's the fact. Well, this gives you an, a, a sense of the um, leakage, what's called the um, disposable income leakage from black neighborhoods because of the dearth of commercial investments in them. So in this particular neighborhood, in the Kenwood neighborhood, there's a leakage of a, almost $200 million uh, a year because of the lack of commercial investment in poor black neighborhoods. Okay, so my final critique, which I'll give uh, some data from my book, is based on um, this idea that, the mixed in, that mixed income scenarios promote a tyranny of the middle class. Myriad stories of negotiation, conflict, resistance, and displacement in gentrifying neighborhoods illuminate the middle class biases that prevail when the incomes mix. Middle class desires for trendy boutiques and upscale restaurants went out over pawn shops and ethnic food stores. Their affinity for dog parks and alley and garage parking curtails usage of those spaces by children. And their fear of young black and Latino men prompts the police to sweep them from the street corners. The middle class is coveted not just for its money, but for its saving graces. Even when poor families have a new grocery store at which to shop, a new bank in which to begin saving, new neighbors to give them job information, and a safer street on which to walk, the new community is not always friendly, a friendly place to them because one of the underlying assumptions of mixed income approaches is that poor people's behaviors need to be modified and or controlled. So this gives you a sense of some of the, again, assumptions behind these mixed income approaches um, that I argue denigrate the social networks that poor people have already, and Sandra will be talking about some of those social networks. And in fact, some people are arguing now that the mixed income communities actually don't have it right because, um, because of the mismatch in the kinds of jobs that professionals have access to and that low-income folks are looking for, there is a mismatch between the kind of job information that the higher-income folks in a mixed-income mixed community might have and the kind of jobs that the low-income people might need. Um, there's always this assumption about social control um, and that, mixed in, that the higher-income people will uh, act as purveyors of order and strong management and this idea of role modeling. So two examples give some insight on how mixed income strategies may not exclude the poor per se, but are clear that their success relies on the exclusion of the poorly behaved. So the neighborhood that I studied is North Kenwood, Oakland. It's, on, it's in Chicago. It's on the south side, just north of Hyde Park, where the University of Chicago is, and about 10 minutes uh, south of downtown, abutting Lake Michigan on the east. And so you, you see the inset over there. Um, in 2004, when North Kenwood, Oakland was in full stride with the construction of housing across the neighborhood, a task force of residents was convened to decide on the future um, for this neighborhood, and the mission was to, quote, to plan for a, quote, safe and harmonious mixed-income community with affordable housing for all families and an aesthetic and functional physical environment. So one of the, um, oh, this, uh, just trust me, the neighborhood's gentrifying, the income's going up, the poverty rate's going down, the housing prices are going up. There we go. Um, 
At one meeting of the task force, a resident made a suggestion for how to improve the physical environment. Her, focus, her idea was to focus on one of the main thoroughfares, Drexel Boulevard. This is a photograph of Drexel Boulevard in the late 1890s. As this idea took off, task force members imagined an inviting active space. They would add direct decorative benches, garbage cans, flower pots, and repave the cracked and buckle path that wound through the parkway. They would invite a competition of artists to make some of these things, benches and garbage cans and so on. In essence, they would return Drexel Boulevard to the grandeur it enjoyed in the late 19th century when it was, quote, one of the preeminent addresses in the old suburb of Hyde Park. Into this discussion, a local police officer, a member of the task force who represented the first emphasis on a safe community, offered the following, quote, when we're thinking about working on Drexel Boulevard, we should really think about discouraging some of the current uses there because people are out there barbecuing and setting up tents, selling snow cones and drinking, and just doing all kinds of things. People seem to think of it as a park, and they just come out and plant themselves. I would like to see a larger contingency of residents use the parkway. I've heard complaints from many people that they're afraid to go out and use it because some of the people there. So we want to think about that as we plan. A number of suggestions flowed in support of this com comment, such as making the benches uncomfortable, issuing citations for unlicensed vendors, or designating a specific area of the parkway for barbecuing. I was also a member of this task force. In response to this line of brainstorming, I raised the concern that our ideas might, contra might contradict the second goal of the task force, which was to build a harmonious community. These various deterrent strategies might alienate and anger the people who enjoyed the parkway as it is, as was this particular family who was having a birthday barbecue out um, quite uh, fortuitously for my purposes, I really, uh, given the comments I had heard at the community meeting. Um, but I was told that the parkway was not harmonious because only a small minority of residents used it. And if the complaints received by the police department were the best indication, the ways in which that small minority used the parkway closed off its use by other residents. I asked, is barbecuing there illegal? And the police officer said that it wasn't. She looked for the right words to describe what was going on there. She tried loitering, and loitering, of course, is illegal. And I said, was well, loitering, you know, was that really? What was the problem? And of course, socializing in the parkway was exactly what the parkway was meant for. So I didn't want to make my point too forcefully. I'm a participant observer, so I participated, and now I decided I had to observe. And I turned my attention to observing and observed the conversation drift toward turning Drexel Parkway into a completely passive decorative space with large flower arrangements and sculptures with no walkway and no benches. I also observed that none of the people whose use of Drexel Parkway, like this family, none of those people were at this community meeting. The participation in many community ma meetings was disproportionately uh, homeowners and newcomers to the neighborhood. Homeowners have yards and decks on which to socialize and barbecue. They don't need Drexel Boulevard for such purposes and are fine with admiring the parkway as they drive along it and look at the pretty plantings. This exercise on how to manage public space in a mixed income neighborhood foregrounds the way in which the face off of homeowning middle class recent arrivals against people who play their music in public areas, socialize in groups, or barbecue in parks can both be rhetorically disdainful and substantively hostile. Working class and poor residents suffer as their behaviors are delimited by the desires of middle class newcomers. So I have a second example, but I don't want to take up uh, too much of Sandra's time, so I'll, maybe I'll wait for that in the Q&A. It's about actual displacement um, of, uh, of rental um, families who rent in the neighborhood through increases in um, uh, security deposits and general harassment of young people who might be using the courtyards of public buildings, but I'll save that. Um, so in both of these examples, this is the point at which the benefits of gentrification, which is a type of income mixing for a time, and this neighborhood also has the traditional Hope Six projects that I've been talking about, that these benefits of mixed income housing do not flow equally, and established poor residents feel and indeed are increasingly supervised and disciplined so that the new residents can fully enjoy the neighborhood as they desire. Such middle class tyranny denies the possessions, rights, and humanity of poor residents. An alternative, the alternative to these scenarios that privilege the middle class is to instead encourage and require greater tolerance on the latter's part. 
Most programs that move poor families to non-poor neighborhoods or place poor families in these new mixed income communities have some kind of training for low income families. They have to go through good neighbor housekeeping training the public housing families who moved into mixed income communities. This underscores the belief that poor families are inherently in need of some kind of behavioral reformation. They are taught how to be good neighbors in this new environment. But the same kind of training is never provided to or required of middle income families, assuming that by dint of their economic success, they must just know how to act. But since this is social engineering of a sort, perhaps nothing should be taken for granted. In particular, mixed income developments have the opportunity to broaden the horizons of middle class folks. If training programs cannot fully convince them of the comforts of sitting on the stoop or the likely harmlessness of loud cursing teenagers, which they themselves might have been at one time, or the fun of multi-generational households or the sociability of barbecuing in the park rather than sitting on their back decks, then at the very least, they might increase respect and tolerance for such choices and arrangements. This is a, a photograph of the demolition of the public housing in North Kenwood, Oakland. Um, there will be 120 public housing units built on this site where there were 700 units demolished. So you see the decline in the public housing on this site. And this is, again, the kind of uh, visual representation of contemporary end slums campaign. For most players in the public policy and planning worlds, neighborhood revitalization is synonymous with attracting middle class newcomers. The most aggressive uh, of, the, of these kinds of programs is the transformation of public housing. Most approaches um, to renewing poor neighborhoods and public housing projects begin with this premise that higher income residents are the most important ingredient for a healthy neighborhood. This commentary, however, has tried to bring to light the biases inherent in such an approach and the people and places it leaves behind. These critiques are not meant to imply that mixed income approaches are all bad or that they have no value or that they should be suspended in favors of direct investments in poor neighborhoods. I think there is a place for these kinds of programs. Rather, it's a call for policymakers to treat poor and black communities fairly as a focus for advocacy, as places that are already mixed income and still under-resourced, as places that absorb voucher-holding families who do not make these mobility moves, and as places with functional social networks, rational modes of behavior, and respectable modes of moral codes that deserve consideration and nurturing rather than wanton dismantling and transformation. And I'll stop there and turn it over to Sandra. Um, good afternoon. Um, like Mary, I'd like to thank Sheldon and the National Poverty Center for the invitation to come out and speak to you. Um, in some ways, you, know, you can do a lot and, and get acknowledged by your peers, but when you get in, invited to come back home, and this feels like home to me in so many ways, um, certainly my intellectual home away from home, and in, in a number of ways, these people feel like my family here. It's, it, it, it makes me feel really good to be back and to be able to share my work after um, publication. So I, too, would like to thank Sheldon. Um, you know how much I appreciate you and, and care about um, this community. So here we go. Um, so how do we explain persistent black joblessness? Um, engage most urban poverty scholars on this issue, and you'll likely, likely be met with one or more of the following explanations. One, due to the changing structure of urban economies, there has been a dramatic loss of good paying jobs for lesser skilled workers, and this loss has had a disproportionately negative effect on black inner city workers. Two, despite claims to the contrary, race is still one of the most important factors affecting blacks' life chances as evidence from audit studies on, on employer, employer discrimination has shown. And this has had the most profound effect um, on black ex-offenders. Three, embedded in subcultures of defeatism and resistance, the black poor do not value work as a productive enterprise and so have endless excuses for why they cannot find and keep work. Four, the black poor, especially residents of neighborhoods characterized by concentrated disadvantage, are socially isolated from mainstream ties, 
who can inform them about job opportunities. And so they don't find out about these opportunities even when job opportunities increase. Um, and more recently, I think that there's been discussion about multiple barriers to employment, um, largely driven by research based uh, research, research that's focused on the effect of welfare reforms. And here, the black poor often have multiple barriers to employment that make finding and keeping work rather difficult. So while these theses do not exhaust the list of explanations offered, they do represent those intellectual discourses that are, that are most often deployed regarding persistent black joblessness. So in Lone Pursuit, I contend that although each of these theoretical frames is compelling and each has wide appeal, we cannot draw from these singly or in combination in order to come to a complete understanding of persistent black joblessness. This is because with very few exceptions, none of these perspectives examines the process of finding work from an ethnographic, from with, with finding work in ethnographic detail, engaging the black poor in in-depth interviews about the process of finding work that they undertake. Two ne negative consequences for understanding persistent joblessness result from neglecting this approach and the assumptions that underlie it. The first has to do with meaning making. Structural accounts of black joblessness, although profoundly insightful, often fail to consider the extent to which the black poor actually understand their experiences or circumstances as such. To the extent that researchers do consider this, they largely assume that the black poor do understand that their employment problems are largely rooted in structural constraints. Proponents of the cultural deficiency perspective do not ignore the meanings that the black poor attribute to, the la to their labor market experiences. Instead, they critically misstate them, arguing that the black poor do not work because they either do not believe that they can handle the difficulties associated with keeping, um, finding and keeping work, or they find morally repulsive the opportunities to which they have access. The black poor, however, neither see structural factors as most, as most pressing nor are they motivated by subcultures of defeat, defeatism or resistance. Instead, they largely explain persistent joblessness as a result, um, as a failure on the part of individuals to uplift themselves. Although employer discrimination and the changing structure of the urban economy have had the most profound effects on the employment of the black poor, prior survey research suggests that among the black poor, Structural factors such as discrimination and job loss do not register as major impediments to achieving their goals, but deficient motivation and individual effort do. Thus, even while acknowledging the um, prevalence of discrimination and other structural constraints, poor blacks nonetheless largely conclude that hard work and individual resolve are most essential for blacks' achievement. My own respondents, 103, young, low-income black men and women from Southeast East Michigan were no, no different in this regard. The majority indicated that finding a job was not difficult at all because jobs were readily available. To the extent that jobs were not in abundance, those with perseverance would not, nevertheless prevail because any job seeker with motivation and drive could find one. Those who could not were simply not looking, and so joblessness indicated a weakness of character a failure on the part of individuals for, for, to fight for what they wanted. Furthermore, with an abundance of programs and services um, available to aid the poor's, the poor's transition to employment, res my respondents argued that the jobless had no credible defense for the persistent joblessness. So by failing to examine closely the process of finding work, proponents of these perspectives have neglected or misstated the meanings that the black poor attribute to their circumstances of employment meanings that affect their actions in the economic realm and impact their employment outcomes above and beyond the structural factors that also constrain them. And these views had consequences for how the black poor um, job seekers and job holders engage each other during the process of finding work. Given the explanations for joblessness that the black poor most often deploy, tensions and conflicts pervade interpersonal relations between these two sets of actors. Um, infusing their relations with distrust and provoking uncooperativeness. So this leads to one of the um, key sets of findings that I report in Lone Pursuit. Although most of my respondents saw value in using personal contacts to find work, when actually in a position to assist with job information or influence, job holders were not so op en enthusiastic or optimistic. Indeed, reluctant personal contacts, that is job holders who usually chose not to assist, or who limited the assistance they did provide, they were in the majority in my sample. 
consisting um, on constituting some six and ten job holders. When queried about their reluctance, these job holders raised three concerns. 20% had come to believe that those without jobs lacked the motivation and determination to follow through on offers of assistance. 10% expressed concern that their referrals were too needy and that by taking part, um, um, by taking on job finding obligations, they would become responsible not only for job getting, but for helping um, their referrals stay employed, thus compelling or compounding the stresses in their already overburdened lives. And most importantly, 70% of these job holders feared that once hired, the job seekers that they helped would act irresponsibly on the job and thus would compromise job holders' reputations and labor market st stability. In all, 80% of my respondents, um, reluctant personal contacts, expressed one or more of these concerns, perceiving job seekers as too risky and perhaps too undeserving to um, trust with assistance. The job holders' perceptions of untrustworthiness were not without consequence. In all, 71% of those who expressed one or more of these issues, these concerns, were reluctant to pro provide job finding assistance. Just 17% of job holders who didn't express any of these concerns were reluctant to assist. So given the extent to which um, concerns about motivation, neediness, and irresponsibility shaped job holders' perceptions of risk and affected their willingness to assist, it's any wonder that they assisted at all. But they did. Um, some 87% had helped somebody, some family members, friends, acquaintances, even strangers in some instances in the past um, to find work. However, the extent and nature of assistance depended on a number of key factors, including job holders' own reputations with their employers, the strength of the relationship between job seekers and job holders, um, and most importantly, job holders' assessment of job seekers' reputation. Indeed, 75% of my respondents reported that when in possession of job information and influence, they largely based their decisions on what they knew about job seekers' prior actions and behaviors, both um, on the job and in the, their personal lives. These signal to job holders the likelihood that job seekers would act responsibly throughout the employment process with particular interest in whether or not these job seekers would do anything to negatively affect their um, job holders' own reputations. Respondents like Shirley Wyatt, for instance, focused on job, job seekers' work reputations. The 27-year-old unemployed single mother of uh, four explained, if I know what type of person they is, if I know whether they actually going to get the job and stay at the job, or are they one of them people that, you know, I know after the first two little paychecks, they're going to be quitting, ain't even no need for me to be telling you because you ain't going to be staying there. This was also how Cynthia Wilson made sense of whether or not to assist her brother. Because of his past behavior in, in the labor market, she was skeptical that he would be consistent and dependable if she were to facilitate his hire at her job. At the time, she worked full time at a calling card company making $9 an hour um, and learning computer skills. She explained, first of all, figure out what type of work history they already have. You know, versus someone like my brother, for instance, he wanted to get a job. I'm like, no, because you jump from job to job to job. Can't do that. Well, he finally found a job that he liked. He's been there, I think, for two years now. Now, if he came to me and said, well, Cynthia, is your employer hiring? No problem. No problem. So even though her job-seeking relation was her brother, with whom we can assume she had presumably had a long history, the strength and nature, oh, well, maybe not always, you know, um, <clears throat> lots of step families. Um, so the strength and nature of their relationship was somewhat inconsequential, right? Instead, the history of his behavior on the job is what interested Cynthia the most, providing her with information from which to deduce her brother's future conduct. Once he repaired his reputation um, by working steadily with one employer, Cynthia was more than willing to provide assistance. So 38% of my respondents, like Shirley and Cynthia, considered job seekers' work reputations when deciding whether or not to assist. Like employers, they were concerned with whether or not job seekers had been stably employed, the circumstances under which they left their last job, the frequency with which they moved from job, one job to the next, and how they typically behaved at work. As one respondent proclaimed, you're doing the same thing an employer would do, like a reference check. But 43% of my job holders considered how job seekers carried themselves outside of the employment arena when deciding whether or not to assist. Of special concern were those respondents described as real ghetto. Um, 
And these individuals, these were individuals whose behavior included being loud and raucous, abusing illicit drugs and alcohol, and taking part in criminal behavior such as robbing and stealing, because such inclinations would almost certainly destroy job holders' reputations. So in the form of drug and alcohol abuse and robbing and stealing, um, ghetto behavior was little tolerated. As Cynthia Wilson again explained in reference to another job-seeking friend, Cornelia, she was like real ghetto, you know? She was heavy off into drugs, and I, and I was like, I don't think so. You're not going to make me look bad. Each time Cornelia would inquire about job openings at her place of employment to save face, and the, uh, Cynthia would lie. She recounted, I just um, said they're not hiring every time. I know one point in time they got to be hiring, but I was like, they're not hiring. And then she starts to laugh, and then she, she yells, it's a freeze, like a job freeze. Um, since that time, Cynthia and Cornelia have become best friends, and Cornelia now knows that Cynthia misled her about the job past job opportunities. However, Cynthia still refuses to assist her friend, who has yet to overcome her addiction. In situations where job holders were embedded in networks of relations in which a number of people had problematic reputations, the thought of providing job finding assistance caused great concern. This was Robert Randolph's issue. Robert was a 32-year-old unmarried and unemployed father of three. When asked how he determined whether or not to assist, he explained, you know, because I know a lot of people that smoke rocks, um, which would be crack, you know, and do drugs, and not really serious about getting out here and finding a job, those are the people that, you know, I would say, well, there's a person out there that may have something for you, you know, you go talk to. I would put him in contact with somebody, you know, but wouldn't, but wouldn't put my name out there and recommend him, you know? I wouldn't do that, no. Since so many of his friends, his own friends regularly committed theft and larceny, Mon Monroe Lashley expressed similar concerns. Monroe was a 35-year-old single father of three. And he said, I got friends, you know, that's thieves that want to rob and steal. You know what I'm saying? How would I be like trying to get them a job where I'm working at? Then the boss's car come up missing or something, or, you know, a computer come up missing. In situations like these, the prospect of providing assistance was inherently risky uh, because so many of their friends, family members, and acquaintances were known to be of such ill repute that job holders felt that they could not trust them to behave appropriately. Job holders had a greater range of responses toward job seekers known for their raucous ghetto behavior. Um, some, like Henry Wilson, found ghetto behavior offensive at all times, a sure sign that the offender did not share their values and attitudes and just, thus could not be counted on to represent them well on the job. Similarly, Gary Hansen, a 31-year-old unemployed father of seven expressed concern about how job seekers would represent him, explaining if they would be the type of person to say something like, oh, man, fuck that bitch, man. You know, that's not the person I would want to put my name on the line for. Statements such as the one Gary quoted, while far from innocuous, in the context of a pri private conversation might be interpreted as such. However, for job holders making decisions about whom to trust with their names and reputations in the labor market, st statements such as these are a sure sign to job holders of job seekers' vulgarity and boorishness, attributes that job holders don't want associated with their names. And this is no, was of no small consequence for Gary. He had once assisted a good friend only to have that person um, be fired for frequent absences, cursing, and intimidating others on the job. As Gary understood it, he brought the street to the, um, to the job, you know, and you just don't bring the street to the job. That's a total separation. While they have remained friends, Gary would not contemplate assisting this friend again. Um, other job holders were all, only offended by raucous behavior when the individuals they were connected to seemed oblivious to context. For these job holders, acting ghetto itself was not to be scorned. Indeed, when socializing with Kith and Ken, it was actually quite enjoyable. Problems would arise, however, when individuals did not take their context into consideration. Job seekers' inability to discern the proper context for acting ghetto was the primary reason Brenda Bowen gave for refusing assistance. A 36-year-old separated and unemployed mother of two, Brett and Brenda explained, I hate to be judgmental, but I look at the way this person is reacting. If you can't control yourself in public, no matter that you're not in a job, you're out in public, and these, pe these are the people that you really don't, don't know, and they're judging you. And the only thing they can judge you by is what they see. And you don't know how to act, you know? You're speaking ignorant, you know? Because I've been around a lot of, around people like that, you know? Say, for instance, I don't know you and you're walking past, and I'm standing here with this girl, and she's just cussing and just saying all sorts of ignorant things. I might say it, but when you're walking past, I'll stop. 
So like Cynthia Wilson, Brenda often lied to job seeking friends and relatives like the one she just described about opening about job openings at her place of employment. Job holders paid so much attention to the reputations of their job seeking ties because of the potential damage job seekers might do to their reputations. Indeed, it was the interaction between the, the two, job holders and job seekers' reputations, that seemed to matter most in their determinations. What was noteworthy from um, my data was that job holders with stellar reputations on the job were generally open to providing job finding assistance, um, while those who had tarnished reputations um, in the eyes of their employers were patently against providing assistance. Um, what was striking, however, was, were the narratives that were provided by job seekers like my Jackie York or Jer Jeremy Jessup. Um, both began providing referrals in good standing with their employers, but as um, because they in, in, and because they were held in high regard initially, they were willing to influence the hires of job seekers with questionable reputations. But as these hires failed to work out, both of their reputations became tarnished and they became increasingly reluctant to recommend any of their friends um, for jobs, deeming the process inherently risky. Um, Jackie eventually lost the confidence of her employer. Jeremy lost his job by helping um, um, friends who didn't work out. As a result of outcomes like these, both job seekers and job holders' reputations dominated job holders' concerns about whether or not to assist. So instead of assisting then, these job holders literally ranted about the value of self-reliance, of individualism to the job search process. Um, so this leads me to my second set of key findings, and that is that <clears throat> job holders' calls for personal responsibility and self-sufficiency were not without consequence. Instead, they had a profound effect on the job search strategies that um, job seekers deployed. Although roughly 90% of my job seekers had mobilized friends and relatives for help in finding work at some point in the past, and although about half of them had found their current or most recent job through a personal contact, um, a significant minority of job seekers were disinclined towards using personal contacts at all to find work. For instance, when job seekers were asked what advice they would give to youth entering the labor market about how to find jobs, an open-ended question for which they could um, provide any response, about four in ten pointed to institutional sources like um, temporary employment agencies, welfare to work transition programs, and the like. About another four in ten advised these walk-in strategies. So just kind of go down the street, see who's hiring, and put in an application. Um, the majority, some three quarters, strongly encouraged new entrants um, to check local newspapers daily and to surf internet job banks for job postings. This one's something of a paradox, given that no job seeker I interviewed had ever. Um, who searched and submitted resumes via the internet had ever found employment this way, not even a peep from employers. But what was most telling was that um, uh, personal contact use was suggested least often. Just one third recommended that young job seekers use personal contacts at all. Also, when I asked what job search strategies that, um, that unemployed job seekers were employing to find work, Four in ten said that they were they sought assistance from formal institutions. Six in ten checked want ad um, want ads in, in other media sources, and greater than two thirds um, did walk-in strategies or used walk-in strategies. Just one in four unemployed job seekers said that they were actively engaging friends and relatives for job finding. Clearly, these figures are not mutually exclusive. On average, unemployed job seekers listed two search strategies in, on my, in my sample. Among those using one search strategy, half were walk-ins, about a quarter sought assistance from formal institutions, and another quarter sought um, information from media sources. No unemployed job seeker relied solely on personal contacts to find work. Um, so in an effort to understand some, of, uh, some job seekers' ambivalence towards personal contact use, in a labor market context where employers rely heavily on informal job referral networks for hiring, I compared the job search experiences of willing and reluctant personal contact users. Willing personal contact users were job seekers for whom assistance from personal contacts was all, almost always welcome. So they represented about 74% of all of my respondents and were distinguished by comments that usually took the following form. I always use people that I know, you know? if they um, have a way to get in or whatever. They're the first ones I go to, actually. And using friends, relatives, and acquaintances is very important because they actually have the inside scoop. So yeah, I use all the resources that I can. 
These comments contrast sharply with those of reluctant personal contact users, the 26% of respondents who were disinclined towards relying on friends and family members for help finding work. The latter was characterized by such comments as, I try not to use people to get a job mostly. And I mean, if you can, get, if you can network like that and get a plug in that way, that's fine. But I wouldn't necessarily say that I, that would be my way of getting a job, you know, because I like to do things on my own. Or I'm usually on my own, out on my own doing my own thing, trying to find my own line of work. I'm not saying the input won't help, but I'm usually on my own. When queried about their reluctance, two concerns emerged as central. As with job holders, both concerns implicated reputation and trust, or the lack thereof. First, Reluctant job seekers expressed concern that they would be unable to fulfill their obligations associated with getting help. Specifically, they were concerned that their behavior on the job would almost certainly negatively affect the status and reputation of their job holding re relations. And in the end, that such an outcome would highlight the extent and nature of their own untrustworthiness and incompetence. And the concerns were not necessarily unwanted. Reluctant personal contact users were more likely to explain their difficulty finding work in terms of past delinquency, um, such as drug and alcohol abuse or felony con convictions. Reluctants were also far more likely to have been fired from their last job than were willing personal contact users. Not surprisingly then, reluctants were less likely to feel that their job holding relations would or even should in some instances put their names and reputations on the line for them. And so they often chose not to ask. This was the case for Anthony Redman, a 36 year old high school dropout and convicted felon. Given his circumstances or characteristics, one could not understate his probability of gaining employment. In the search for employment, there are few if any attributes that cripple job seekers more. Um, indeed, when I met Anthony, he had been without steady work for just short, short of a year, even though he said that he was constantly looking. Um, in part, Anthony explained his difficulty getting a job in terms of his two, two strikes. As a black felon, he believed that flu, few employers would seriously entertain the idea of hiring him. And although he expressed a great deal of frustration regarding employers' refusal to give him another opportunity to prove his worth, much of his anger about the state of his life was really self-directed. It was clear that no one frustrated Anthony more than he frustrated himself. In his mind, he was his own greatest obstacle and in some ways deserved to be cast aside. The distrust he had inspired in others had largely been warranted. After all, he believed he had little if any, well, after all, he had little if any trust in himself. Thus, when he was asked about the importance of using friends, relatives, and acquaintances for finding out about job opportunities, Anthony explained that while they were important to the process, he preferred not to rely on this essential source of job finding. Instead, he explained, you, can, you ain't got to worry about me using your name to get in the door. Just give me an application, just turn, turn it in for me. That's all I ask you. When I asked Anthony why, um, he replied, because, you know, say if I do get a job and mess up on the job, I won't drag you down with me. So I prefer not to use your name. You got any friends? This is him mimicking what an employer might say to him. No, I heard about it on the website, or you know, work first. Probing further, I asked whether Anthony had ever been in a position in which he had botched a job a personal contact had found for him. When he explained that he had not, I pressed further still, asking why he assessed himself as such a high risk. To, the, to that he answered, because things just happen. I'm like bad slip rock. I don't have no luck, none. Um, that's a fact, none. Anthony had come to believe that he had little power to determine the course of his own, his own life would take. His life experiences up until that point had almost completely crushed his self, sense of self-efficacy and in the process weakened his spirit. Thus he deemed it irresponsible to subject anyone to his unpredictability, his untrustworthiness. He alone owned the task of finding a job, a very lone pursuit for someone with so many individual and structural barriers um, to overcome and so few tools with which to do so. And just as he perceived himself as untrustworthy, so too did he perceive his friends as such. Consequently, not only was he opposed to receiving job finding assistance from friends and relatives, save receipt of information about job openings, he was also reluctant to proactively assist his friends in their quest for work. He explained, I'll use the same method on others that I use on myself. I used to tell them, I get you an application, but don't use me at all. If you mess up a job, it won't fall back on me either. When I, probed why, when I asked why he and his friends did not provide more proactive assistance, he provided the following justification. See, my friends, I can't speak for no other people friends, but my friends, they not like, they, they not like that. See, we roughnecks. 
You see, you all call us thugs, and you know ghetto. We, we just call ourselves roughnecks because we're not, we not thugs. We used to be that. We, we're just different than most people. We see somebody that we know. If they need some help, we give some support, help them out, and we'll let, them, we'll let him or her know, don't use my name <clears throat> um, because you know how you is. You know your temper or your attitude. This is a telling quotation for a number of reasons. Anthony clearly perceived himself and his friends as outcasts, members of a, stigma, a group stigmatized by their delinquent past. But he also distinguished them, uh, and, and they distinguished themselves, by their attempts at redemption. Anthony revealed to me that uh, the promise that he made to avoid uh, made to himself to avoid at all costs the illegal activities that led to his early incarceration, a promise he found increasingly difficult to honor as months of an unemployment approached a year. However, the re redemptive process itself was largely in isolation because although members of his group provided some assistance and support, the dominant discourse that they deployed was one of self-sufficiency. In other words, even among members of Anthony's caste of sorts, the stigma of thuggery and untrustworthiness prevailed. And so job seekers could not expect that others would be willing to go to bat for them. For them. This, coupled with individuals' unwillingness to seek aid for themselves from personal contacts, forced job seekers of Anthony's ilk into self-sufficiency. They were pulled into self-reliance by their distrust of themselves and a desire to protect or salvage reputations, both their own and others. And they were pushed into the same by their distrusting peers who were too reluctant to, for, to assist for fear of the negative consequences. This consistency between their expectations of themselves and those of their job holding relations produced an exaggerated independence, um, a defensive individualism that informed their job search behaviors. Um, <clears throat> Um, reluctant personal contact users also expressed great concern that their request for assistance would be met with rejection that would call into question their trustworthiness and competence. In this sense, job seekers sensed others' deep trust, distrust of them, and this perception led to a disinclination to seek assistance from their job holding relations. Compared to willing personal contact users, reluctants were far more likely to report that their contacts had responded to their requests or offered assistance in the past in such a way that left them feeling ridiculed and diminished. Whereas 58% of reluctant personal contact users expressed concern, 22% of willing personal contact users did. Abigail Tyson fell into the former category. When Abigail and I sat down to talk in the living room of her close friend, she was a 32-year-old single mother of two daughters who for the past two months had been making $8.50 working at a local, um, uh, on the assembly line of a local manufacturing company. Abigail explained that in the past, she had not had problems gaining, gaining employment on her own. She could approach any employer, convince him or her of her worth, and leave with a new job. Indeed, she had found both of her prior steady jobs through walk-in strategies of job search. However, after being convicted for retail fraud, a felony for which she received two years probation and a hefty fine, she found it exceedingly difficult to find work. Like Anthony, she hypothesized that her conviction rendered her unattractive to employers, saying, I used to go and fill out applications all the time and did not have trouble with an employer calling me back because I didn't have a felony then. I could get a job like that. With the felony, however, she believes people just throw the application away or something. And yet, in the midst of these growing and uh, major and growing obstacles to employment, when asked about the importance of using friends and family members to find work, she responded, I try not to use people to get a job mostly. Prompted to elaborate, she explained, I probably will use them for a reference or something or call and be like, I used you for a reference. I'm going to apply for this job or something like that. But you know, like sometimes employers say, do you know anybody that work here? Most of the time, I say no. So I try to. I feel like I can get in, if I can get in there by myself, then forget it. That's just the type of person I am. Abigail's steadfast commitment to work and finding work on her own, or at the very least without personal contacts, appears to make little intuitive sense. However, her general orientation to receiving job finding assistance um, from friends and relatives does make sense when one considers her prior experiences in this realm, specifically how she felt she was regarded by those who had approached her in the past. Abigail explained that not long before our meeting, she and her friend had approached her sister and the friend's sister-in-law for help securing jobs. 
her sister was employed at a company that offered employment, summer employment starting at $11 per hour, a very desirable wage in this community at this point in time with the possibility of permanent placement at summer's end. When Abigail and her friend pressed her sister to provide assistance, uh, however, pleading, won't you help us? Can't you put our name in or something? We'd like to work here and get some com computer skills or whatever. Abigail recalled her sister replying, no, I don't want you to work here. You ain't gonna mess up my name. Needless to say, both Abigail and her sister-in-law felt rejected, disappointed, a bit perplexed, um, feelings that only intensified when they discovered that having refused to grant their request, Abigail's sister helped another woman get a job um, at the same place. According to Abigail, her sister made no attempt to refuse their request in a way that would have pre um, preserved their dignity, reputations, and self-esteem, and that would have sustained a long-term relationship of expressive and instrumental exchange. On the contrary, her response was much more of an indictment against them an in indication that they were far from having earned the trust necessary to partake in such an exchange. No doubt Abigail's spotty work history and felony conviction was a great cause for her sister's concern. Abigail was too high a risk to take in her sister's um, estimation. Priors notwithstanding, however, Abigail interpreted her sister's rejection as an attempt to keep her down. So feeling deeply affronted, she vowed to reject any requests her sister might make for assistance, especially but not limited to requests for finding job, um, for job finding assistance. Um, but she was also disinclined towards making requests for herself as well um, to any other um, relatives that she had access to who could have hooked her up with jobs. Um, taken together, two-thirds of my reluctant personal contact users described one instance after another in which their ability to meet obligations was called into question or their requests for assistance were met um, with scorn. Thus, when they declared, I like doing things on my own, they were showcasing their defensive individualism. Their de declarations of autonomy and self-sufficiency and the concomitant avoidance of personal contact use emerged only after they perceived that help was not forthcoming and in some cases should not be forthcoming, less, less because their ties were unable to assist than that they would, and in some cases should, be unwilling to do so. So by embracing individualism, avoiding inform informal assistance from friends and relatives and pursuing self-reliant, though relatively unsuccessful, job search strategies, not only did they attempt to protect job holders' reputations and to shield their own from further ridicule and disparagement, they also sought to repair their reputations by demonstrating evidence through their self-reliant approaches of their autonomous, self-sufficient, and driven natures. This is an almost tragic and ironic turn. As such, performances of autonomy and self-sufficiency only serve to disadvantage these reluctant personal contact users further in a low-wage labor market context where, context where employers rely heavily on job referral networks for applicant recruitment and screening, where job seekers struggle with multiple barriers to employment, where decent job opportunities are indeed declining um, significantly, and where employer, employer discrimination is pervasive. So to end on that happy note, thank you very much again for the invitation. <laughs> <clears throat>
a trend that's been identified uh, probably three decades ago, but we really don't know much about how this is playing out, uh, what the consequences are, uh, and so on. So uh, African -American, the African-American middle class uh, has made grand, great advances um, despite continued racism and discrimination, um, but in some sense, uh, uh, an urban poor African-American group has been uh, left behind. So we see this, uh, for example, in the lifestyle conflict that conflicts that Professor Patillo identifies, the, the barbecue example uh, being a, a great one, um, where uh, sort of behaviors that are associated with uh, poorer African Americans become stigmatized, uh, even though they would be sort of normal behaviors otherwise. Um, and there's also a, a great discussion in Professor Patillo's book about the role of middle class African Americans as which he calls middlemen, so brokers between the African American community and white elites, and their ability to um, enter into white elite networks in Chicago uh, to gain resources for the African American community, but on the flip side, often in a way that, that uh, has detrimental consequences for poor African Americans in, in the community. So the de demolition of public housing would be sort of the most uh, obvious example of that. Uh, this inequality among African Americans is also highlighted by Professor, Professor Smith's research um, in that we see that the poor African Americans, because of the distrust and defensive individualism that she identifies, are, are not as able to take advantage of uh, economic advances among uh, middle class African Americans. A second theme is the continued importance of past racism and racial inequalities in structuring today's urban problems and urban inequality. Uh, so this is what uh, Professor Patillo in her book calls the ghost of urban renewal, which kind of serves as a backdrop for all of these conflicts uh, within um, the uh, Kenwood and North Oakland communities that uh, she's writing about. And perhaps the, the, the best example of this that she gives uh, is that there's th this conflict over resources, uh, particularly the type of housing that's going to be uh, in the gentrifying community, is at first glance, a conflict between poor and middle class African Americans, but it has to be understood in the context of uh, racial segregation. So that a, a history of racial segregation in Chicago makes it such that poor, uh, that, that white neighborhoods of whatever class have property values that are too high for uh, public housing to be even considered in those neighborhoods. And so that, that, that forces public housing to be uh, shifted towards African American neighborhoods. And if we don't sort of realize that, that historical context, then we might just see it as a conflict among uh, African Americans. Uh, and, and we can also see this in, um, in Professor Smith's work. I think one of the interesting things to me, because I study neighborhoods and concentrated poverty, was that a lot of these problems of distrust and defensive individualism uh, that she identifies are actually more, uh, more of a problem and create, create more issues for uh, poor African Americans in concentrated poverty uh, contexts where uh, there's even more uh, of these sort of issues. Another theme uh, in, in both works is the role of social capital in helping us to understand the microdynamics of urban inequality. Uh, so in Professor Patello's book, she shows how middle class African Americans, again, are able to become middlemen brokers and to infiltrate white elite social networks um, and thereby gain power over, over resources um, in the city. And for those of you who are interested in schools and school reform, there's a very nice chapter in the book uh, that talks about local school reform and the way that uh, middle class African Americans who move into the um, Kennewood and North Oakland neighborhood are able to capture uh, sort of the planning process for the local schools and set the schools up in such a way uh, that it particularly uh, benefits uh, students who are, who are well prepared uh, by setting up selective uh, uh, charter schools and in leaving behind uh, a good number of the students from poorer families. Uh, Professor Smith, along these same lines, shows us that social capital uh, has to be activated. It's not just inherent in social networks. Uh, and the inability uh, of her respondents to transform their network ties into job leads helps us to understand a high unemployment among African Americans in the inner city. And then finally, uh, one thing that was striking in, in both uh, books is, is the way that the black poor are a highly stigmatized group and face additional burdens uh, because of stereotypes that are, in a sense, unique to them. So um, 
Professor Smith in her book has uh, an excellent chapter which she didn't have time to talk about, which is kind of an ethnography of a Michigan Works uh, job placement and, 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 and training center. Um, and what's striking there is the way that the managers and uh, the other caseworkers uh, employ racial stereotypes about their own clients, uh, particularly the stereotype that uh, African American men are simply going to be unable to even take advantage of the services. They're just so um, disadvantaged, uh, so lazy, etc., um, that they're not even worth helping and they get push, pushed off and pushed away uh, from the services in part, it sounds like, to uh, increase the success rate of the, uh, of the managers uh, running the center. Um, you, her, Professor Smith's work also highlights the way that the African American urban poor um, sort of internalize some of the, the stigmatizing stereotypes. Uh, I'm not sure if she would agree with this reading of her data, but certainly we can see, um, or I see in some of the quotes, the idea is that um, the, the subjects seem to take in the, those uh, stigmatizing characteristics about being unsuccessful or lazy or uh, or, or, or easy to give up or, or so on, and that affects their, their whole worldview uh, with regard to work. And then um, another example of, of the black poor being a highly stigmatized group, it comes from Professor Patillo's book, again, this idea of the lifestyle differences, the, the barbecue uh, becoming um, a sign of disorder in the neighborhood. And the, in a sense, the, there are these conflicts uh, that she describes in the book over uh, quality of life issues where middle class residents see anything that they associate with um, poorer African Americans as uh, something that should be criminalized. So barbecuing becomes loitering is, is, is perhaps uh, the greatest example. So some questions uh, perhaps for discussion. Um, one that comes to mind from Professor Patillo's work is uh, under what conditions is a stable mixed income or mixed class urban neighborhood possible, especially one that benefits all of its residents, middle class and poor alike. Um, as Professor Patel described, um, sociologists and other social scientists have been concerned about the pernicious effects of concentrated poverty uh, for a very long time, and mixed income neighborhoods are thought to be one solution to that. But she also shows how uh, when, when neighborhoods are in the process of becoming mixed income, the conflicts are created over schools, uh, rental housing, public housing, the use of public space, uh, the different lifestyle behaviors in public space. Um, and there seems to be pretty bleak prospects for the inclusion of poor residents uh, in the long-term future of the neighborhood. Maybe that's an uh, exaggeration of, uh, uh, of how negative things are. Um, but it certainly heads in that direction. Um, so in the end, uh, in, in Kenwood and North Oakland, it seemed that most benefits, most changes benefited only the middle class African Americans in the neighborhood. So there was some reduction in, in crime, which of course benefited, benefited everyone. Um, but a lot of the changes that were put into place uh, were resources that required some degree of initial resources on the part of the individual to take advantage of. So uh, having your, your um, children prepared to enter the selective schools or uh, having uh, the money to, to uh, shop at uh, the expensive boutiques or restaurants or even the fancy grocery store. Another uh, question that comes to mind uh, for issues of, of concentrated poverty and urban inequality is how specific are the problems and issues that we're discussing today? Uh, how specific are they to cities like uh, Chicago and Detroit? So, uh, these two cities are historically among the most racially segregated in the country, have some of the highest rates of concentrated uh, poverty, and uh, now I think um, scholars are beginning to recognize that different cities have very different conditions of, of concentrated urban poverty. So uh, an example would be uh, University of Chicago sociologist Mario Small, who's argued that concentrated urban poverty may be very different in dense cities like New York uh, or Boston compared to post-industrial cities like Chicago and Detroit, where poor neighborhoods are especially characterized by depopulation, uh, physical isolation, and so on. So are we likely to see uh, different, perhaps more optimistic findings in cities such as New York, uh, Los Angeles, uh, 
for Boston. Uh, more generally, uh, a third question is, what does the growth of the African-American middle class pretend for racial inequality? So uh, Professor Patilla shows us that uh, increased access to power structures and social networks uh, of the powerful for Chicago's African-American middle class, um, but that doesn't necessarily translate into better prospects for most of uh, Chicago's African-American poor, or at least the, the neighborhood uh, she, st she studies. And more broadly, I think she raises the important point that uh, middle-class African-Americans can't by themselves uh, deal, deal with larger issues of failing schools, lack of health care, fundamental changes in the economy, and, and persistent discrimination. Uh, there's a sense, I think, among her uh, middle-class respondents that they have a um, uh, an obligation to sort of uplift uh, their fellow African Americans, um, and that's certainly uh, noble and, and, and important for them to, to, to participate in these sort of endeavors, but uh, it's also um, a little bit sad that everybody else thinks that it's just the African American middle class whose job it is to help uh, the African American uh, poor. Um, and so along these same lines, uh, Professor Smith shows us that distrust and defen defensive individualism make it difficult for poor African Americans to take advantage of uh, African American middle class uh, advances in terms of economic power, uh, authority, and in control of institutional resources. So I'll s stop there. In closing, I just want to say that there's much more to these uh, two fascinating books than uh, we've had time to, to talk about uh, today. So I urge you to get your hands on them and spend some time absorbing uh, their arguments and findings, and I look forward to audience discussion and comments. Thanks. Okay, the floor is open for questions, and if you could please come to the microphone uh, because this is being taped, and if you uh, don't speak from the mic, um, it won't get picked up. George. Thank you for two very interesting presentations. Uh, Professor Patillo, the stylized uh, fact, is, people would argue, is that uh, more integrated, economically integrated um, uh, communities uh, provide some protection for, for the poor in the sense that they're able to mobilize resources to protect the community as a whole. Now, we know, of course, that the most segregated economically segregated areas are among the wealthy. So clearly it doesn't work, that argument doesn't work. But is there any evidence at all that there is any uh, distributed good that comes from economic integration of neighborhoods? I think definitely there's, there's lots of evidence of some distributed goods. And so that's why I tried to end by saying this is not a wholesale um, takedown of mixed income community strategies because the people who, the poor people who get to stay in these neighborhoods do benefit sure. from the improvement in safety, the improvement in um, schools, some of which, some of which are selective enrollment, some of which you just have to get your application in early and it's a lottery. Um, the appearance of, um, of businesses and so on. The, the question there, I guess my critique is twofold. My critique is not of economic integration. It's of the, um, some of the, the pitfalls of economic integration as they are practiced, especially in public housing redevelopments, is the decrease in hard units for poor people and the fact that by and large, the majority of people who were there won't be able to benefit from the new changes. So. Um, if there were a way to perhaps increase density so that everybody was there can stay and then you just increase density and new people can come in as well, I think that's a different kind of approach. My, I guess, and then the third part of my critique is that um, economic integration is one strategy, but there could also be strategies where um, the investment might come before the middle class folk get there <laughs> yeah. uh, and is not um, tied to their having to come first before the public sector moves in. Right. Thank you.
I have a question for Professor Smith. Um, I'm a student in the School of Social Work, uh, and when you were talking, you mentioned that uh, distrust could be overcome by uh, people having alternate employment where they could establish a track record of some sort. Um, so a social worker may say as well, okay, so maybe we should try to provide those alternative opportunities to them. But I suspect the answer is not as simple as that. And I was wondering if you had any uh, thoughts on what the paths to those solutions might be. I mean, I think in good part, we're dealing with a population that has multiple and severe barriers to employment, right? And in part, there are people who are in a position to either provide information or influence hires are responding to some of these multiple barriers. And those, multi those barriers that make it difficult for people to find work also make it difficult for people who can assist to do so. Um, and as David pointed out, not only did I find that among personal contacts, I also found that within the context of job, the job center, having multiple barriers made it so that people were less inclined towards putting forward assistance that could move people forward. So I think what becomes important here then is providing programs and structures that deal with the barriers themselves. And I think once that happens, you'll find that people's behaviors start to look, at least in terms from the perspective of the job holders, will start to look a lot more responsible. Um, so I think that that's the root of a lot of these issues, right? So what is it that makes it so that some people can't get to work on time? Transportation was one of the major issues that my respondents talked about in terms of being able to get to work. Um, spotty transportation services, public transportation services, um, transportation that didn't go to various parts of the, the, me the metro area, that made it really very difficult. Um, Child, having appropriate child care or safe and affordable child care also was another issue that people brought up. So there were a number of factors that got in the way of people's, people being able to establish track records that were, were you know, fairly long and positive um, in terms of their relationships with employers. And I think that when job holders then were in a position to determine whether or not to assist, they were in some ways um, drawing from this. I mean, there are other issues too. Drug abuse was um, something, or alcohol abuse. Those were issues that some of my contact, my respondents would talk about. And here again, these requ require, I think, in good measure, programs that deal with those issues and a discourse that makes it okay to seek assistance when you have those kinds of problems. Um, but in none of these situations that led to these multiple barriers to employment were there um, programs that were fairly effective at dealing with them. So people dealt with them on their own or didn't do anything, and I think it made it so that they appeared um, far less marketable. The people who would want to put their names on the line for people who looked in the way that they did. So I think by dealing with those deep-rooted problems, you would uh, you would affect the way that these job seekers look in such a way that would make it so that anybody would want to put their names on the line for them. But that doesn't exist, nor do I think it, it will, given the current um, disposition towards the problems that exist in, in these kinds of neighborhoods. So I think we need to shift our thinking about it and think about really kind of affecting changes in that way. And it's through that that I, that I think greater trust will emerge and people will be, become more cooperative. I just want to add one interesting thing about what are some of the barriers to work is people's many obligations to the various welfare state programs that they're connected mm -hmm. to. That's so right. That's right. it's hard to go to work when you got an appointment with, your, with the person down at public housing right. office. Right. And if you don't go to the person down at public housing office, you're not going to get your right. housing choice voucher. And so, you know, these competing, uh, whatever it might be, appointments yeah. you have to keep that all happen nine to five at the That's same right. time you're supposed to be at work That's right. um, are another source of challenge. Yeah. Mary, I have a question for you. I'm really fascinated by the barbecue example for reasons that you might already anticipate. Um, I mean, one thing that fascinated me was um, this idea that there's certain spaces where particular behavior should take place, so a barbecue should happen in your backyard. It shouldn't happen on a, a roadway where I presume people are driving, are driving by. And um, the second reason that it interested me was because it suggested that the middle class people believe this is our neighborhood, and even though we have mixed income housing, we're only letting you stay here. We're sort of tolerating you. And the condition under which you can stay here is that you must remain invisible. So I wonder how much of the fact that um, working class people were on public display is also a factor in addition to 
the fact that they've moved this backyard behavior into this public space? Yes. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I think you're exactly right. I think it's about, um, it's about the use of public space most especially. I mean, I think you hit it right on the nose. There, there are two, the two things going on. It's the assumption that the way that middle class people can socialize, everybody can socialize, and the, the just sheer not thinking through the fact that everybody doesn't have a backyard. I mean, if, you, if I showed more pictures of Drexel, it's lined by um, large courtyard apartment buildings, and some of the courtyards, they have back stairways, but you'd rather not people barbecue on those lest you put the whole thing on fire. So it's a, it's a, better, it's a smarter choice to barbecue um, in front. Um, so the people not thinking through a lot of these things, everything from, you know, people complain, why these people always sitting on their porch, talking on their phone, doing all their business out on the porch? Well, it's summertime and they don't have air conditioning. You have central air. It's really comfortable in your house. It's not if your house is overcrowded and you have, you know, it, it, it's, it's quieter on the porch to talk on the phone than in the house to talk on the phone. So just not thinking through how people's economic circumstances lead to certain different uses of public space and uses of people's bodies and so on and so forth. Um, and then the second thing, I think you're, you're just 100% right. It, it's so interesting to counterpose the celebration of um, group uses of public space when it is consumer driven. Things like um, um, cafes on streets and restaurants on streets where you can see in, in more affluent neighborhoods as well as middle class neighborhoods and that as long as you're sitting there you know you are paying for a dinner, you are buying a drink right there um, as opposed to free uses of public space which seem to be more denigrated, especially when it's poor people. I mean, I think you're exactly right about not wanting to see poor people in public, whether it's doing things like barbecuing or um, old, there's a lot of old men who just who sit around and drink uh, and, and have little boom boxes and play the blues. I mean, even that is, uh, people are very interested in their property values and what's that gonna mean for potential buyers who are driving through the neighborhood and what that'll mean for the pot potential um, upward trend of property values. Um, I do want, because I hardly ever get the opportunity to talk about the flip side, and I think uh, David mentioned this. So I have this idea of middle class brokers, uh, middle brokers, and, and I have examples in the book where pro people are brokering important resources for this neighborhood. So the brokerage happens both in terms of its, um, its uh, establishment of forms of inequality, but also its bringing of very important resources. So the people who run nonprofits in the neighborhood and the people who um, run social service agencies, these are middle, middle men as well. These are brokers as well. And they are both, they are fighting for affordable housing. They are um, bringing, the schools have a mixed valence, but they're often brought very much with the intention of bringing what should have been in this poor black neighborhood for years. So the language by brokers is one very much that includes this uplift. It's just that there is a tension between sometimes, because it's, it's, there's a tension in strategies, what's in the best interest of the black community. Uh, thank you for your important work. Um, my question is kind of related to Karen's. I'm just wondering about home ownership and this modern uh, urban renewal. And do you see home ownership as like a major issue, especially for black people? And if so, what type of possibilities do you see and implications from home ownership? Um, I might ask you to elaborate a little more. I mean, mo the ma vast majority of people who are moving into the neighborhood are purchasing as opposed to renting, even though the majority of the neighborhood is still renters because there's a lot of multi-unit buildings. So tell me a little bit more. Right, well I'm thinking about like what Karen said with people feeling like these poor people are on public display and maybe they feel like I bought into this place, these people are renting and they feel more of a sense of ownership. So I was just wondering, ah. do you feel that, is there a possibility for these people who are in this mixed ne income neighborhood to eventually buy in? Is, there, is that a possibility, is that something that I think I, okay, I think I understand. Which, there's no question that the ownership red, rhetoric is key. And it's actually something I don't think I elaborate. I didn't, I, I, it would have been nice to take that analogy to talk about when you buy a house. It's almost like you, not only are you now a homeowner, but you're a community owner. That, that that's really key. And the big rhetoric is all around, I pay taxes. And it's all about as a taxpayer, 
as a taxpayer, everything has to work the way they want it to work because they're taxpayers and renters aren't. So, aren't. so taxpaying is a big um, part of the rhetoric around ownership. Um, and the, but the rhetoric is not around, you know, renters should immediately become owners and then they'll get due respect. I don't think there is such naivete around people's uh, such quick upward mobility, that kind of thing. Um, I th yeah, it's not, is that getting at what you're saying? Mm -hmm. No, thank I you. still feel like I'm a little missing something. Well, I, I'll, I'll catch you after. <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the things that this sort of ties into what George said, but I think in part because the white poverty rate is so low, mm -hmm. you don't see these kinds of situations develop. But the one I thought of as you were just talking is in the areas near the university, the homeowners talk about the students mm -hmm. the same way the middle class African Americans right. in your community talk about the poor. These people sit on the porch, they leave their beer kegs in the front yard, <laughs> right, right, and right. indeed close to campus there are neighborhoods that are trying to get it rezoned mm -hmm. so that they're not multi. So it, what, one of the questions is how many of these things are class conflicts that would be similar in the white community if there were these class interactions, mm -hmm. but because there's a smaller white poverty rate, you may not have this kind of concentration. But that, that language sounds yes, very definitely. familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Sylvia? Um, hi, I enjoyed all three presentations. Um, I wanted to ask you because, you know, a lot of your work stems from the work initially of William uh, Julius Wilson, Bill Wilson, uh, and how he studied the issue of joblessness in the black community. And I remember that in When Work Disappears, in particular, which is based in Chicago, and he talked about the nature of poverty in Chicago neighborhoods in the 1950s and how that had changed. And then in the 1980s and on, you get you know, the decline of manufacturing and so on and so forth. And that's really when joblessness sets in. And one of the things that was in there, which I think uh, uh, Sandra uh, alluded to, is that the issue of role models. Okay, because I think that, that Wilson thought that in the 50s, when the black community all lived together, irrespective of social class, there were people who were poor, but, but, the, but they were the working poor, and there were a lot of very good role models for young kids who were very poor. While when the community in the 80s and on becomes jobless, then in fact you also lose the good role models that the working poor can represent. I, I just wondered if you could say something about the issue of role models in the community. So that's for me then, okay. <laughs> the issue of role models in the community. Um, you know, one of the questions that we asked uh, in, in the study was about um, the role models that people had as they were coming up, role models around work. Um, and so a lot of our respondents were the kids of people who were working in the factory, so were working in a big three. Um, so this was their, mo so they saw their fathers working, um, and often sometimes their mothers didn't work, but oftentimes their mothers did, mo mothers and aunts, et cetera, also worked in the factories. And I think a lot of them envisioned that this would be their future, so that this would be their future. Um, and most of them were pretty happy with that. Um, so they felt like that when they were coming up, a lot of them felt like there were possibilities. Um, but the structure of opportunities changed. And I think while people saw that the structure of opportunities changed, they, uh, they didn't necessarily under, uh, make the link between those changes and their ability, inability to make ends meet. Um, so I would have, so, so for instance, I would have um, several um, young men who would talk about how their fathers were able to take care of the whole family on one income, and they're struggling to make uh, to make their paychecks last um, on their own, and they couldn't understand why they couldn't be the kinds of men that their fathers were. So, I th in some ways, I think that that's kind of in, in, it's kind of debilitating because psychologically, their the models of real men were models from over a generation ago, where men could actually. Take, either take care of their families on their own or do most of the work, right? So these were real men who figured out how to make it work. Um, they don't have the same kinds of opportunities but have the same kinds of desires, right? And so it leaves them feeling um, less than men. It leaves them feeling emasculated in a lot of ways and I think that that's part of what they're struggling with. This is in part what's making it so that people want to do things on their own. Their fathers were able to get things done. Um, but they don't seem to be able to make that happen. And I think that this is in part what they're struggling with. Um, 
So it was interesting that the model set in their heads what seemed to be possible. A lot of that didn't change. I actually think some of Al's work in the uh, minds of marginalized men shows this. There's the image of the, the factory worker and these stable jobs remains, um, but they're not able to, to achieve that. And on some level, I don't think that people are getting quite why that, that's the case. And so it's making them feel as if there's something that they've done wrong. Um, so that was a really interesting part of it. And uh, I think the majority of my respondents were kind of like this. So they had these, they had family members who were embedded in factory work as they were coming up and so had some measure of stability in that shifted as they became adults. Um, so yeah. I think the interesting thing about the assumption of role models um, is also that the, in, in these neighborhoods that I study, which are relatively contrived, because you know you have you, you end up with a whole with a whole bunch of vacant land because you've torn down a whole bunch of public housing and then you build something totally new and then you bring in people who don't have a clue who you know coming from all very so they're very contrived and I think that makes the kind of place I'm studying more unique although my first book was was more of the kind of um, nostalgic mixed income community this the kinds of places I'm studying now are more contrived but what we don't I don't, what, what the nostalgia for role models doesn't um, capture is the mix of modeling that the working people give off. So in the, these contrived neighborhoods that have really stark distinctions between upper income people and lower income people, the upper income people are modeling not just work, but a whole bunch of things that poor people don't like. Meaning for, poor, for the poor people who live there, those people don't know how to act. They don't know how to be social. They don't know how to speak to their neighbors. They build back decks when they could be sitting on the front porch. I heard a horrific story the other day in one of these mixed income communities. I was meeting with some tenant leaders. And in her neighborhood, where there's kind of a series of row houses that are public housing on one side and upper income housing on the other side, the people who live in the upper income housing go across the street to walk their dogs in front of the public housing and let their dogs do their business on the other side of the street. I mean, they just, so, so the stories that people, t that the public housing residents are telling in some of these very contrived communities, these are not people to be looking up to. I don't care if they do get up and go to work. That's the other thing. They're at work all day. So, it's, so and when they come home, they close their doors. I mean, this is, the, every bit of research on mixed income communities finds that there isn't the, um, friendships are not being made. People are not, you're, you're putting a lot of things together. So I think we have a very um, sanguine view of what, what these mixed income communities can do, but we, that's because, <laughs> that's because we middle class folks think that we've done it all right and we're, we, you know, we're doing, we're really nice people and we know how to do it. But some of our life ways are equally objectionable as some of the things we object to on the other side. I want uh, to thank. Oh, can go I ahead. Just, yeah, yeah. Um, and this is um, a slightly uh, a slightly different point than the one that Mary was making, and it connects back to David Harding's question about what does growth of African American middle class pretend for racial inequality. Um, I mean, I think with the growth of the black middle class, it gives people the perception that our opportunity structure is open, right? How can it not be if there are not so many people who are so well-dressed, good-looking, um, black people who are in positions um, um, of note? Um, and so I think people, one, at least the people that I interviewed, and I suspect that they're not unusual, one, they have the image of the past where, there's, where there was hope. Two, they have the image of people who seem to be really successful now. So they know that there's a growth of a black middle class. They see people on TV, um, and they might actually have friend, um, friends, and well, not friends, but family members who are actually doing really well. Um, and not to make this personal, but I have a brother who's not doing as well as I am, and he understands his failure to do as well because in terms of my success. You did it because you worked really hard. I'm not doing as well because I made bad choices. It's all about the choices that I made that left me behind. So I think in some ways in the growth of the middle class and, and even the, the role models that people had in the past, it's making it so people are, gra are embracing even more these individualistic um, understandings of their own disadvantage, right? It's because I'm not or we're not uh, as individuals doing what we need to do to get ahead because clearly my father did it and clearly these other people are doing it good for you for doing so well I need to try harder and it takes our eyes off of the structural conditions that lead to the perpetuation of inequality over time and that is what I think ends up getting lost time and time again I actually can't have conversations with my brother anymore because he refuses to talk about st structural issues <laughs> and only wants to talk about how hard people are working um, 
And so it makes it, I think it makes it really problematic. And I think it makes opportunities for, mobi for mobilizing for change very difficult because people keep focusing on what the individual has failed to do or keeps doing in order to succeed. I want to thank uh, both of our speakers and our discussant and uh, the audience and invite everybody to a reception and informal chat uh, out in the lobby. Thanks. Thank you.